Good evening, I'm Jose Cardenas. An update on one healthcare organization striving to bring health solutions to rural Mexico and see how one man is making custom denim jeans using Arizona products. Plus, we'll talk to the producer of a series focused on Arizona's Mexican heritage. All this coming up straight ahead on Horizonte. Funding for Horizonte is made possible by contributions by the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you for joining us. The TIA Foundation is a group dedicated to trying to find rural health care solutions. The group reached two milestones this year. Here to talk about this is Laura Libman, founder, president, and CEO of the TIA Foundation. Laura, welcome back to Horizonte. It's been a few years since you've been here. Uh, and because of that, remind us how TIA got started and what your intent was. Uh, my intent was to address poverty in rural Mexico. I spent uh, a good portion of my childhood down there, my mother's family's from there, and I always wanted to go back and do something. So I studied international development at Thunderbird to learn some effective ways of dealing with poverty. Health is a a key factor in alleviating poverty. And the approach that you chose to take is reflected in, in the foundation's name, Tia, the Spanish word for ant. Yes. Uh, we train health workers that are elected by their own villagers, and they take care of the, their neighbors. And our philosophy is more like an ant who advises and mentors rather than a parent who goes in and and tells them how things should be. So that's why we came up with the name Tia. And you've been doing this since 2005. Yes. The model, as I understand it, involves participation by, uh, is it the University of Guadalajara? It's the Universidad Autónoma de Guadalajara, their community medicine program. And, and how do they participate? What do they do? They are a wonderful training partner we get a brigade of medical students, pasantes, which are interns, and their professors that go with us out into the field and do the training, do hands-on care with the villagers, and also do our, our health education programs in the schools and in the villages. So right now, what parts of Mexico are you working in? We are now in four states in Mexico. We are in Jalisco, where we started, we're in Colima, we're in parts of Michoacan, and parts of Zacatecas. And we talked about two milestones in the introduction, and, and, and the first one is, is the number of people you've served in the nine years since you started. Yes, uh, about a week and a half ago, we reached uh, over 100,000 people that we are now serving in Mexico. We've got some pictures of the work that's being done. Uh, I want to start with a couple that focus on uh, the health brigade, as, as you describe it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and this first one um, is what? They're taking blood pressure? Or they're, no, actually, this is, this is a, a, what, a, showing how to deal with a broken arm? Um, it's actually a broken clavicle, how to stabilize a broken clavicle so the patient can be transported to escalated care. So you've got some, the students, uh, who I assume are in the in the, the, in the medical coat. garb, yep. and, and are, then are these villagers who are being taught how to do this? Yes, they are. They receive very extensive training. Down there it would be called primeros auxilios, sort of like an EMT is here. It's a little beyond that. They learn how to set up IVs, they learn how to give injections, they even learn how to deliver a baby. We hope they don't have to, uh, but they learn how to do uh, quite a few uh, very necessary things in communities where they're hours away from medical care. And, and they spend about a, you know, the teams are there for about a week, is that right? Yes, okay. yes. We've got another picture that I want to put up on the screen. Um, and, and, and this, as I understand, shows what? The registration process as, as the villagers are coming in to, uh, uh, for the education? Actually, that is the examination for the health workers. They each receive a medical kit that's valued close to $2,000. And we need to know that they acquired the body of knowledge necessary to use that medical kit. So we have to be confident in both their practicum skills as well as their basic knowledge. So that was their uh, final examination of our most recent 
project launch, and they all passed. And how do you make sure that what's taught in this one-week period is, is continued and that it's implemented? We pre-negotiate with the local governments, the municipalities there, so they provide continuing education and resupply of the medical kits. And that's something that we negotiate ahead of time. And that's what uh, allows us to be fully self-sustaining. And um, in, in terms of accomplishments, uh, obviously the fact that you've served 100,000 people is, is an important one. Yeah. But, but what other things over the last, last nine years are, are you particularly proud of? Well, we now have 200 and I think 61 health workers after our last launch. We have not lost a single one. None of them have sold anything out of their medical kits. They're all volunteers. That's one thing I'm extremely proud of. We do follow up studies to check on our villages and we haven't lost anyone. They're all still very enthusiastic about the work they do. The other thing I'm very proud of is that we have one of the best medical schools in Latin America as our training partner. So I feel that our health workers get world-class training. And give us a sense of the kinds of medical issues that you're dealing with in, in these rural communities. The primary issues we deal with are actually metabolic disorders like diabetes, high blood pressure, obesity. But we do in some areas have scorpion and spider bite problems and in the malnourished that can be deadly. We also have issues with dengue fever, some places have cholera, uh, influenza outbreaks like we saw when I was here five years ago with H1N1. So before we get to the second milestone, which is an important thing to talk about, uh, I want to talk quickly uh, about the uh, efforts to expand your services. And we've got a couple of pictures oh, yeah. of some of the indigenous populations that, that you, you want to expand to. And, and this first one, I think, is uh, Huichol? Yes. And what part of Mexico are we talking about? They're in, it's called the Mano de Jalisco, that sort of hand that reaches up in, in the geographic state of Jalisco. And they live in an area extremely remote. It takes 18 hours or more to drive there. Uh, and they have very little health care. There's about 40,000 living there and one doctor. So we would like to get some health workers trained, but some of our brigade, we're going to actually have to fly up in small planes to get them up there and have our mobile medical units follow on road. And then another population that you want to serve. Actually, when you know people talk about the Aztecs, it's yes. really the, the Nahuatl yes. peoples uh, of, of central Mexico. And we've got mm -hmm. another picture of, of uh, some of those people, another group that you want to reach. Yes, uh, I visited these people on my last trip to sort of do some of the advanced planning for our next project. These people live at least, the first set of villages, four hours. Uh, they don't have vehicles, so it's a four-hour walk for the nearest villages to get to medical care. So you need money yeah. to do this. And, and in fact, you, you, you survived the, the downturn in the economy. Uh, uh, congratulations on that. But, but the other milestone we want to talk about is, is a fundraising event, which is kind of a first for you. Uh, tell us about that. Yes, we have a world-renowned artist, Felipe Castaneda, who's a sculptor, who has donated some pieces, as well as uh, Jose Luis Cuevas. Very, very famous Mexican artist. Yes, and we're really thrilled about it. Uh, we are co-hosting an event with the Mexican consulate who is happy to help support our work in Mexico. And uh, we are also having a matching grant program during that to cover the Nahuatl communities. So uh, dollar for dollar, any of the funds we receive, I think it's before mid-November, are going to be matched by that donor. And, and the event itself is? It's a week from Saturday. It's November 8th. Well, good luck on that event. Thank and, you. and thank you for joining us. And, and uh, we wish you the best of continued success in your efforts. Thank you so much. And it's much. good to see you. Oh, thank you. In 1872, Levi Strauss and Jacob Davis came up with an idea to use copper rivets to strengthen denim cloth. The idea was a hit, and jeans soon became a mainstay of American clothing. Producer Shauna Fisher introduces us to a Phoenix man who is taking jeans 
to a whole new level. To say Roman Acevedo loves denim is an understatement. For him, it's a way of life. You know, I remember having the big drawer full of 501s where I would pull the drawer open and I would look through them to find the ones with the least amount of holes so I could wear those to school. You know, so denim for me, you know, it just takes me back to, back to being a young kid running around the city and um, I think it kind of resonates with a lot of people that way. After 18 years in the restaurant business, Acevedo decided to open Lawless Denim, a custom denim and leather goods store. We do everything from denim jeans, jackets, shirts, uh, leather jackets. All our belts are made by us. All our women's totes, our denim and leather totes, and our oiled leather totes are done right here. Rows and rows of denim line the walls. And chances are when you create a custom pair of jeans at Lawless, they will also be one of a kind. We've selected some of the finest denims in the world, primarily cone mill and Japanese. It's all salvaged denim. And we work very hard to source very limited production, very limited runs, maybe dead stock. So we'll get 50, maybe 100 yards if we're lucky. And from there you get to select your denim. Uh, then you'll pick your buttons, your pocket liners, your thread colors, and then we take you in for a fitting. And we take about 10 different measurement points so we get the perfect fit for you. Johanna Root is coming in to get fitted for her second pair of jeans. She says being able to be a part of the designing process is what caught her eye. And then from then just picking out which one looked coolest to me and it was, it was really awesome. And then picking out um, buttons and rivets and stitching. Um, you can have three different kinds of stitches and different colors and so it's, you can really get creative um, designing them. I went for the gun metal. <laughs> it was exciting. It takes roughly two to three weeks for Acevedo's seamstresses to sew the jeans. It's exacting work. Since they're working with a limited supply of denim, they have to be sure each cut and each stitch is perfect. It's that dedication that has driven Acevedo to pursue his second passion, putting people to work. I started Lawless um, for two things. One, I, I love denim and I love leather. It's, it's those materials that only get better with age. And secondly, I wanted to find a way to put people back to work on a consistent basis and what I think I've identified is a real need, you know, and that need is the skill set to make our own goods. So that's what we're all about. How many people I can put to work and give them a good job with, with a good career. His goal is to put 200 people in Phoenix to work. Part of that work involves creating their own denim using 14 vintage looms from the 1920s that Acevedo has housed in a nearby warehouse. These were the kind of looms that Levi Strauss used to use. And uh, what we're going to be doing with these is setting them up to produce denim and chambray. To my knowledge, it hasn't been done west of the Mississippi in a salvage format. So it's something that we're very excited about. We'll be using Arizona Pima cotton to do that. So we decided, let's take this a step further. Let's not only make our own jeans and use our own Arizona copper for our buttons, but let's make our own denim and chambray. In the end, for Acevedo, this is much more than just a business. It's a chance to weave together his dreams and his community. You know, uh, when I close up the store at the end of the day and I walk out of here, I'm always fixated on my next move and what's going to happen the next day and what do I got to do to continue to grow this and take it to the next level and how can we perfect the product even more and, and being proud of, of, of having something that really you know, makes a difference here in Arizona. Jeans at Lala's Denim start around $79 a pair. Lala's Denim is located in Cityscape in downtown Phoenix. Here at Horizonte, we want to hear from you. If you have comments, story ideas, or questions, Email us at horizonte at asu.edu. Last month, the Phoenix College Liberal Arts Department started presenting the first of three episodes of Arizona's Mexican Heritage, an American Story film series. We'll talk with the producer and the director of the series in a moment. But first, here's a look at a clip from episode one, The Origins, exploring the evolution of Arizona's Mexican heritage. Gente valiente. I was born in Arizona's desert country. 
As a young boy, we used to come here, my family, my friends, and just run around and enjoy the desert. That's my hometown, Phoenix, Arizona. It is now the sixth largest city in the United States. But back when I was born in 1947, it was still a relatively small city. And this is the house I was born into. It's located a few blocks from the state capital in what was known as La Maravilla. My father, a World War II veteran who earned the Bronze Star at the Battle of the Bulge and who was also a prisoner of war, he and his compadre, my Nino, Aurelio Bernal, they built this house. It was a fine house for us. There were two rooms. That time it had windows. We had uh, water right up to the uh, front yard, a uh, wood-burning stove, and an outhouse. Everyone I knew was a Chicano, which is what most of us called ourselves in Phoenix way before the Chicano movement of the 1960s. When I was three, we moved into a grand house. It had two bedrooms, indoor plumbing, a gas stove. We were moving up. And the neighborhood was integrated. Like many structures of the Phoenix of that day, that house has been torn down. When I went to school, I had difficulties because I couldn't speak English very well. And my teachers couldn't speak Spanish. And there was something else about school. There were no Chicanos in any positions of authority. When it came to books, there were no Chicanos in books. It's like we were invisible. Here with me now to talk about Arizona's Mexican heritage and American story film series is producer and director, Dr. Pete Dimas. Pete, welcome back to Horizonte. We've oh, had you, you here to talk before about the history of the Mexican community in Arizona. The clip we just saw begins, it's episode one, it begins uh, relatively modern times. You make some reference to your own upbringing and you show some, some photos of, of the house you lived in and the books that were in school at the time. But, but it really is The Origins, which is the name of the first episode, takes us from, from pre-conquest Mexico to about the time of the Civil War. Give us a little bit more. Well, basically, uh, it's a reaction to the reality. When I went to school, there was nothing about uh, Mexicans, Chicanos, anywhere. And even when I was in high school, I'd hear teachers tell us things about cowardly people. And I knew that wasn't true. And so I wanted to look and see where did this connection come? When, when did it begin? And I come to find out it's uh, over 4,000 years old in Arizona, reaches into central Mexico. And uh, so we take a tour through that uh, reality. Then we take a tour uh, of the evolution of the Spanish, so why are they so powerful? And also take a look at that conflict that takes place that uh, you know, people look at, at that conquest as if the Spanish come in and just roll over the uh, native uh, nations there, and that's not the case at all. We're talking now 1519. When yeah, the, 1519. Because the... basically what we have here is the Mexica, or the Aztecs as we call them, had an empire. And the problem with empire is that uh, there's a lot of people that don't want to be in your empire or conquered. And so what you really have is a rebellion where the Spanish are taking advantage of the Indians but the Indians are taking advantage of the Spanish. And what, what really throws a monkey wrench in the whole thing, the whole political calculus, is the disease factor that just wipes out the leadership and much of the core of those uh, uh, political and societal structures. That smallpox. Leads, uh, yeah, smallpox and then others that over a course of a century drop the population from say uh, 25 million down to about a million. And we're talking about a dramatic shift and uh, as a result, you have the importation of uh, Africans, but since it's a Catholic country, it's only for one generation, and they're part of the gene pool. You have the movement north, which uh, produces all that silver that transforms the world economy, not just flowing to Europe, but also the, the thing that surprised me was the amount of silver flowing to China from the Manila trade, which also brings large numbers of people to central Mexico. So we have a this process of mestizaje, this racial mixture. And those are the people 
that move north uh, into what is Arizona, following the uh, mineral trail, the silver mines that are everywhere you look, up the Sierra Madre, you, you find them. And that, that's what uh, moves people up. And, and the supply of all that is where we develop these, these ranching uh, uh, societies, these farming, the individual small uh, uh, miner, all of that is, uh, is part of this, this movement. That so, so what parts of these might surprise people? Because fortunately, Things have changed a bit in, in, in our school system. You wouldn't have teachers referring to Mexicans as cowardly people or, or a complete absence of, of discussion, uh, but certainly not the depth of, of history analysis that you have in, in your movies. Um, what would people be surprised to find out from, from the film? From the films? Uh, the, the extent of the involvement of these people in the actual creation of what becomes American Arizona um, and for example, people don't know that it's New Mexico National, not New Mexico National, but New Mexico volunteers during the Civil War that actually escort the first territorial governor into the Arizona Territory. You know, so what we have here is the people who were here before actually continuing in, in the uh, development of the region now wearing American uniforms. And, and they're the beginnings of... Uh, of many traditions, including the tradition of the Arizona National Guard. So episode one was Origins. Right. Episode two, which has also been shown, these are being shown at, at Phoenix College, um, is creating Arizona. Uh, in, in what sense? Well, commercially. Uh, we, we, th we take a look at the world uh, through the lens of the Industrial Revolution, modernization, but the fact of the matter is you need to have a technology to survive in this desert uh, uh, area. You need to have uh, a means of commercial interaction. And those are already set up from uh, central Mexico and through the uh, Santa Fe Trail, which is really an extension of the Chihuahua Trail into central um, Mexico. So you have the merchants that, that are part of continuing the trade. You have the miners that are necessary in order to open up the mines. And then you have the reality that Anglo-Americans cannot survive uh, in those Apache Wars without the uh, help of the, the Mexican population and the Pima population on top of that, the Oda. So there's, there's a complexity here that people don't realize has taken place. Uh, you have the movement to California that comes from the northern parts of Sonora through Yuma, and they play a major role in the, uh, what we know as the California Gold Rush. I mean, who's going to get there first? And, and who knows how to mine, and, and it's the Mexican population. Now, episode two ends around what, the 1920s or so? 1920s. Uh, and, and, and I saw you... Uh, no, excuse me, episode, episode uh, two ends with the coming of the railroad. And that would be about what time period? 1880s or so. Okay. And, and you see the establishment of schools, the establishment of, say, Arizona State University with the help of uh, the Sotelos and... and the, in Tempe, I mean, you, you see that all these institutions that are vital to us today, many of them have their roots with the Mexican participation. Well, and, and on the first border regions, I think there was a person of Mexican descent. Um, uh, we've got a little bit over a minute left. Let's talk quickly about episode three and then what you intend to do going forward. Okay. A uh, and episode three airs what, November? November 20th. Episode three is the other transformation that takes place, the Industrial Revolution. Uh, where railroads become uh, important, where you need the labor to extract the wealth of the country, and you're going to need lots of Mexican labor to really integrate this part of the nation to the American economy. So you have uh, that part of the story, and it, it gets you have the problems that come with large-scale immigration, and we end up having... Uh, issues of repatriation when the economy goes sour, but as soon as people are needed for work, guess who's called? That's, that's the reality, that's the cycle that we end up at uh, with the 1920s. Somewhat being repeated now. Oh, yes. Yeah. Pete, we're almost out of time. Um, I know you have three more episodes in mind. Give us a quick rundown. Well, Episode uh, four, I anticipate, will be about the Mexican involvement in education. I mean, many of the, the schools were started by 
And these people, whether they came from New Mexico or from Sonora or and part then of Tucson. And five and six were almost out of time. Oh, my God. <laughs> uh, something to look forward to. Something to look forward to. And uh, I'm going to have to release episodes one, two, and three as part one of the series because people are asking for it. Well, I'm sure everybody will be looking forward to it. Congratulations and, and uh, hope you have a good crowd for the next one. Well, I wish I could have thanked the people who helped me. <laughs> well, you have. And, and, and that's our show for tonight from all of us here at 8 in Horizonte. Thanks for watching. I'm Jose Cardenas. Have a good evening. Funding for Horizonte is made possible by contributions by the Friends of Eight members of your Arizona PBS station.